It's a dangerous thing to give two weeks to a preacher to think about his sermon. <laughs> He'll be here all afternoon, but I'm not going to do that to you. Thank you for the vacation we had. It was just an awesome time, and I want to thank Leonard and Yogi uh, for filling the pulpit for me. It was just awesome to be able to ask them to come and, and do that, and I know you enjoyed them, and we just want to thank you uh, for doing that. And we had a great time. I think my the favorite part of my vacation was in Marble Falls eating at the Blue Bonnet Cafe. I had a chicken fried steak, and I've never had one better. And you're going through Marble Falls, you need to stop at the Blue Bonnet Cafe. It was just awesome. The Hills invited us to come up and spend a few days with them at uh, Lake LBJ, and uh, George had a boat, and he pulled me up on skis. The, uh, the engine overheated uh, shortly thereafter, but <laughs> it, it was great. We, we had a great time. The water felt good, and um, Mike and Luke went from there to, uh, to go. Well, he had a good orientation at Tarleton, but then they went on up to uh, watch the Rangers play last night, and uh, they got there when the gates opened, and it was interesting because... Uh, Oh, I guess it was a couple months ago. We had some guys stay with us. They needed a place to stay for a couple of nights. They're trying to get into independent baseball. And one of them was from Japan. And so I asked uh, Toma, is his name, T-O-M-A. I said, how do you say good morning in Japanese? And he said, Ohio. I said, That's pretty easy. So, in fact, the next morning he said good morning. And I said, Ohio. And he, he really surprised him. But uh, they were there to try to get autographs, and uh, Micah and Luke were there, and they were kind of far away from the players, and Darvish uh, was a pretty good ways away. So Micah, he knew one word in Japanese. Of course, this is 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He said, Ohio, 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 and it got Darvish's attention, and he came over to Micah, and he said, Ohio? <laughs> so they got his autograph, so, so they really had a great vacation. It was wonderful. We're glad to be back, and uh, <clears throat> I have been praying about where to go. Uh, it's just been hopscotch, uh, hopscotch here for the last couple months, uh, jumping around, and uh, I really like to work through something uh, from start to finish in a lot of places. And really, I mean, where, where can you go in the, in the Bible that wouldn't be God's will for you to go? But I was just trying to get some kind of... Um, help from the Lord, and, and, I, and I think he gave me some confirmation about uh, where we're going to go, and that's, that's through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews can be a very uh, challenging, uh, to say the least, book to work through. Uh, it, uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff there. I've never worked through the book of Hebrews, so it'll be new for me, as uh, probably for many of you, uh, but it is an awesome book. It's one of the most important books in the Bible that connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. Part of the problem in studying the book of Hebrews, uh, and the book, uh, the Hebrews got, uh, the title got added on later on. There was no title uh, on the original manuscript that got added later on with the copies that we have. But one of the challenging things about Hebrews is that one really needs to have a lot of expertise in the book of Leviticus to understand the book of Hebrews. So we'll, we'll be helping you out through all that. You'll have a pretty good handle on that book as well as, as we work through this, this most important book. And this book was not just written, as all the rest of the, the Bible was not just written for the people in that day, but for us as well. And so um, there are many things that I have to share with you. We won't have time to get to it today. We'll get to it later on. We won't even get into the text today. And, uh, and everybody says amen right there. But we will we'll introduce it to you because uh, with the introduction, there is some application. And we've always got to get to the application, don't we? Because we are not just after mental gymnastics. We are after a change of life. I thought about uh, four little words here that we want to think about when we think about the, um, the introduction here. The author, uh, the audience, the um, attraction, and the last word concerns our application 
And that would be the adjustment that we need to make. The author has been debated for a long time. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, a lot of speculation on that. Uh, it could have been several people. My major commentator that um, I'm following, he just does an excellent job in the New American Commentary, he believes it was Luke. The book of Hebrews is uh, polished, exquisite Greek. Most New Testament was not written in uh, that kind of Greek. Um, Luke was that kind of writer. He was that kind of scholar. The, the theology that he has uh, could be really esteemed in the Apostle Paul, which makes Luke a good candidate because Luke wrote the book of Acts because he had spent a lot of time with the Apostle Paul. And so um, he could be. We don't know. We won't know. And it doesn't really matter. Uh, we know this. We know God wrote the book. The Lord wrote this book. He inspired the author, whoever it was, to write these words. This is part of Scripture. Who did he write it to? Audience. E-N-C-E, -E, right? No? Audience. Audience. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Audience. Oh. Well, that's what I wrote. Allison said no. But if she says no, <laughs> it, it wasn't right. That's the way that works, right, Jason? Yeah. Who was the audience? This is really important that we get this right, okay? Now, when he wrote the book of Hebrews, he didn't say, hey, I'm writing to this group, fill in the blank. He didn't say that. So how would you know who he was writing to? You deduce certain things from what is written in the book. We believe, we're pretty certain that the audience were, uh, were, was, were Jewish. Uh, they were Jewish. There really is no reference in the book per se um, to a Gentile group of people. And, uh, and so uh, the, these are going to be Jews. And, and remember, what is the book in the Old Testament that we really have to have a good handle on to understand this book, the book of Leviticus? Well, the Gentiles who were becoming Christians, they never followed any of that stuff, so they were clueless about all that. They would have read the book of Hebrews, and like us, they would have been like in the dark. So he had to have been writing to Jewish uh, folks. What kind of Jewish folks was he writing to? Well, he was writing, obviously, to Jewish Christians. Uh, these Jewish Christians were people who, who uh, were raised in the Jewish faith. They were presented with the gospel. And many of these were probably second-generation Christians. So many of the people that he's writing to, uh, they may have not met Jesus. Uh, they... Uh, they were some, a good number of them probably down the road, but they knew the Lord, so they had a relationship with God, um, and they were probably uh, Hellenists. How would you know that they were Hellenist Jews? Because every single scripture that referenced the Old Testament in this book comes not from the Hebrew Old Testament, it comes from the Septuagint. Remember, the Septuagint was written 150 years, uh, give or take a few years, prior to Christ coming on the scene. And that was where Hebrew scholars who were fluent in Koine Greek copied the Hebrew Old Testament into Koine Greek. Many of the um, Jewish people of that day and in the day of Jesus and at this time uh, were Hellenists in that um, they were Greek-speaking Jews. And so the language they were most fluent in was Greek. The language then that they most, re the, the, the copy of the Old Testament that they most uh, widely referenced was not the Hebrew Old Testament, but the Septuagint. And we're very thankful for the Septuagint because the Greek is so uh, exact 
And in Hebrew, it can get a little vague at, at sometimes. And so if you really want to understand sometimes when a vague Hebrew word is in the Hebrew text, you can go to the Septuagint and see how the Hebrew Hellenist Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew into Greek. So it really helps us a lot. So uh, these are Hellenist, these are Jewish Christians. What kind of Christ Jewish Christians are they? They are probably priests. They are probably former priests in the Jewish faith. You say, how, how do you know that? Because of how the book of written, the book of Hebrews is written. It is written to people who have a tremendous understanding of the sacrificial simple t uh, system in the temple. Who better than that than the priest? We say, well, did the Jewish priest, did many of them uh, become believers? In fact, the Bible tells us that they did. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, it says that a large number of priests came to know the Lord. Well, where were these priests located? There's a good chance that these priests, this Jewish Christian community of priests was located in Antioch. Well, why did they leave Jerusalem? Because you remember in Acts chapter 7, a significant event occurred. You remember? Stephen was martyred. Stephen was stoned. And the Bible tells us there in uh, chapter 8 and verse 1 that after Stephen was stoned, there was a great persecution of the church. And in fact, it was so great that all the Christians left Jerusalem except for the apostles. They all scattered. They all flee. And of course, this was all of God's plan because, you know, if it wasn't for the persecution, they'd probably all still be there. But God needed to move those people out because he needed the gospel not just to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but to the uttermost parts of the world. Well, many of the priests that we understand in church history moved these Christian priests to Antioch. Now, they were in other places as, as well, but more than likely, um, this is a good place for this text to be written to, and this is probably the audience, at least with the deductions that we can make uh, best we can from the book of Hebrews. Now, um, these uh, priests, these former priests, uh, they are going to have problems. This church that uh, the author is writing to is a church really full of weak brothers and sisters. It's, a full, it's full of Christian people who have not grown up in their faith. And they are having some real issues, some real struggles, and a tremendous pull in their lives. That is, and this pull is anti-God. It is not what God wants for them in their lives. And this is where we'll come into application in just a few minutes, even in our lives today. Now, you have to understand that when this book was written, you know, we don't want to be too hard on them. When this book was written, they, they didn't have the book of Hebrews, right? It's, we're studying it. It was just being written. They didn't have that. They didn't have most of the New Testament. The time we believe that this occurred was obviously prior to 70 AD, right? Because if the, if the temple would have been sacked, if Jerusalem would have been sacked by Titus Vespasian from Rome, we would have heard about it. And really much of this book wouldn't even make sense. But the temple was still in play. Judaism in the temple was still in play. The sacrificial system was still in play. And it was the highlight of Judaism. And that's why this book does make sense and why it has to be prior to 70 AD. Well, we also need time uh, after 30 AD, we need a little time. We need a few years for the disciples finally to disperse from Jerusalem. And then we need some more time because when the author writes this audience, he says, you know, by now, you guys should be teachers. But instead, you need someone. We'll see this later on in the text. But instead, you need someone to teach you. Well, you need time to become a teacher. You don't just get saved 
and start teaching the Word of God. No, you, God has to work in your life. You've got to study the Word of God. You need to grow up. That's why the Bible says don't make a leader in the church a novice, someone who's just wet around the ears. He needs some time. He needs some experience. He needs some time to see God work in his life and to have his prayers answered. He needs to grow up. He needs to mature. And so the author says, you guys should have done that. You had the time to do that, but you haven't done it. So we really believe that this time is probably, prior to Paul's death, it's probably in the early 60s. It's just a few years away from Jerusalem falling and being sacked by the Romans. And so these priests, these Jewish Hellenist Christians, they came out of this, this life where they were used to doing what? Used to being active, so active, so in the middle of their Jewish faith. They were in the middle of the sacrificial system. They were in the middle of the temple ordinances. They were in the middle of going to all of the feasts in Jerusalem. They were in the middle of the synagogue and all of that, the reading of the Torah, the studying of the Torah. All their friends were there. Their parents were probably there. For many of them, their brothers and sisters were there at all these places. It didn't take long before the high priest banned them from everything and said, you're out. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you are out. You, you, are, you cannot come to the temple. You cannot come to the feasts. You cannot come to our synagogues. You can't do this anymore. And so they were excluded from all this. And as a result... They were really lacking confidence in their Christian lives. It's, everything we've known has been taken away from them. And that was a very difficult transition for them to make. And so they had this, they had this pull, like, like maybe we should go back. And what the Lord is going to address in the book of Hebrews is something that is addressed in really no other book in the New Testament. Not even, it's not even a close second, it's way down the list. And that's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. That is that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And when he came, he came to just offer one sacrifice, and that one sacrifice was final. Well, that was, that was totally different. It was a 180 from everything that they were raised with, everything that they grew up with. You, you have to understand that the way that God did it in the Old Testament was uh, he wanted to have a relationship with his people. He couldn't have the kind of relationship he was going to have with us someday in the New Testament, in the Old, so he came up with the law. He presented the law to the people of Israel and made a covenant with them. He said, as long as you obey the law, as long as you obey me, then we can have access somewhat. In fact, for the Old Testament Jew, even in the system that God had provided, you had to keep your distance from God. It, the man that sees God will die. The, the man that goes too close to Mount Sinai will die. You had to stay away. I, in, in fact, this, this access was limited really to one guy, and that was the high priest. And it was, only, it was limited to one guy on one day. And even on that one day when the high priest could go in, he could only go in for a short time. The Bible says, in fact, that if he stayed too long, if he tarried too long, then Israel would be under the terror of God. Man, limited access. And, and so God gave them the law, said you need to obey. Well, they didn't obey. So God came up with a sacrificial system so by they could be, this, their sins could be passed over from one year to the next so they could have some access to God, as limited as it was. Well, how many sacrifices did they have to make in this limited access that they had to the Lord of the Old Testament? The sacrifices happened moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day. It just went on forever. They never stopped as long as they had the tabernacle and then the temple as they were following the Lord. And so these priests who had become Christians, they, they had been involved in all this. It was running through their blood, through their veins. And that all stopped. And as you know, in the New Testament, we only have two ordinances. 
I mean, do you see a lot of sacrificing going on? Do we go to the feast? Do we do any of that? No, we don't do any. I mean, we just have two ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism. I mean, it's pretty simple what we do. Totally different than what they were used to. And so it was causing conflict. And some of them, you'd be thinking about, maybe we should go back. Because one of the other problems they had was in the Old Testament, many of the Jewish anti-missionaries were telling them from the Old Testament that they understood wrong that the Christians misinterpreted the prophecies about Jesus and what the Scripture said about Jesus in the Old Testament. Hence, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is going to use the Old Testament Scriptures, this author, to prove something to them. Not only that Jesus is the Messiah, but the theme of this sermon that he gave, that Jesus Christ is preeminent he is superior, and he is better than anything they had ever experienced in their Jewish lives. They're not getting short, getting cut short at all. They're not sacrificing anything. No, in fact, God did away with this, early temp, this earthly temporal temple to give them a heavenly, eternal temple. And in Hebrews chapter 10, the author is going to say, the access you now have to God because of the Messiah Jesus who has come allows you now to go directly to the throne of God boldly. I'm telling you, that's a whole new thought, okay? Well, they didn't know any of this stuff, so they needed to be taught, and that's why this book is here. Now, as we close and we think about um, the adjustment Okay? The attraction was to go back. The attraction was to go back to that old way of life. So they needed, and they had this pull in their life, so they needed to make an adjustment. That's what the book of Hebrews is going to help them do because they need to persevere. They need to keep going. They need to trust the Lord. They need to see through the revelation of God who Jesus really is and understand what he's done for them. Well, then they needed God to help them out on that, as we all do. So they needed to make adjustment. And I would say to you today that really that's what <clears throat> the pragmatism of the Christian life is all about. Making adjustments. So what kind of adjustments do we need to make? And here's what the Lord has been uh, talking to me, and I, and I think this is why you are supposed to be going through Hebrews. Those are two hearts. So you want to ask yourself which… <laughs> it's supposed to be two hearts, okay? You want to ask yourself which one is yours, okay? Now here's the first heart. We have pulls in our lives. You have things pulling at you. You have, like, for example, you have wants. I want fill in the blank. That's a pull on your heart. You might have um, a desire. I desire, that's a pull on your heart. You might have um, a need. That's a pull on your heart. And all of these things, um, really, they, they look like things like this. I got to have this. And when I have that, then I'll be happy. Right? I got to have my husband to love me. And when he loves me, then I'll be happy. And then I can live for God. People say that. I got I to gotta have the best for my children. I have these goals for them, and I know what I want them to aspire to be and to aspire to do, and I know I want them to have the ed this education and college. they got to have this. I want this for them. I desire this for them. And we do that. And then we look at uh, retirement. I've got to do this. I've got to have retirement. I've got I to gotta do all these things to have this. And then... In case you're not thinking I'm including everybody here, we'll do these things for our grandchildren as well. I've got to have this for my grandchildren. 
And, and you can even take it a step further. You can go, I, I've got to go do something. I've, I've got to go do something extra or, or, or so that I can support the missionaries out there in the world. That All these people are dying in starvation every single day. I've got to go do something to make more money so I can take care of these people. And here that's what I would say to you. I, you, you, you probably don't even recognize the pull that's on your heart every single day, all throughout the day. You probably have not really pegged it, but it's happening. And you know, when you want, and, and all these things, they pull on you like this, okay? All, and, and a lot of these things are good things, and you want to see them happen, and you, but, but you go, so I got to have this, I got to do that, I got to go here, and I can see it. When we were on Lake LBJ, that's where the other half lives. And I could just see why you're, you know, you're sitting in the boat and you're looking at all those things. You go, man, I, if you could live, if you could just sit right there on that back porch, you, would, you could say you had arrived. You could just see how your wants and your desires could just go crazy. And these people in the boats that are just like, you know, $100,000 boat. I mean, they've got everything, all these toys and all this stuff. And you could just see, be caught up in all that stuff. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have any of this stuff, okay, whatever, well, here, but, but stay with me on that, okay? Because when you, when you have all these things pulling on your heart, if I can just get that raise, then we'll have made it, then we'll be there, then I can serve the Lord, then I can be happy. I mean, you just fill in the blank, right? You with me? And what happens is you'll have a heart that's full of conflict and worry. I mean, you'll be, wa- you'll be walking around in the blues. And what you've got to do is you've got to make an adjustment. That's what the Christian life is all about. On a day, that, do you know why you have a quiet time with God every day? Because you need, he doesn't need to make any adjustments, but you do. And you need to be able to see what's true, and what's right, what's black, what's white. That's why you need the word of God. That's why you need God speaking to you. So I'm coming home the other day before our vacation, and I, I, got, I got all this stuff right here, man. I had it. And, I, and that doesn't mean it's all gone. I have to deal with it every single day, just like you do. Because I, I think about, you know, I, I got to go do this because how am I going to go support this missionary over here? I, I can't, you know. What am I going to do about all the people that are dying every single day or starving to death? Well, I'm eating chicken fried steak. And it pulls on you. It just, it pulls, man. It just, it's just like, it's like gravity, man. It's just trying to get you. It's like pulling you back to earth when you're on the shuttle. And it's stronger than you. It'll overcome you. It'll wreck your ship. Paul said, don't let your ship be shipwrecked. Don't let your faith be shipwrecked. And so, Lord, he's, he's talking to me. I need him to talk to me. I need him to help me. I said, Lord, you got to help me because I need help, and the rest of these people, they really need help. <laughs> need to fix this thing is what I need to do. <clears throat> and so the Lord says, you know, Mike, what you need to do, the adjustment you need to make is get rid, get rid of all these In fact, get rid of all these. It was an epiphany for me. I said, you're right, Lord. Not like he's ever wrong. He's always right. You're right, Lord. So I says, Lord, right now, I was praying. I was driving home before we left on vacation. I said, I don't want anything right now but you. And I don't need anything but you. Now remember, these Jewish Christians, the the problem that was causing for them is they had lacked confidence in their Christian lives because of this pull and wanting to go back to their old way of life. And I'm telling you that, that when I confess this to the Lord, 
I said, Lord, I don't have any wants. I don't have any needs. I don't need anything, and I don't want anything. I just want you. I just need you. I'm, I'm telling you what happened, what happens here. And I said, Lord, you, I, the confidence came in. And I said, Lord, what do you need me to do? You can do anything you want. You can meet any need. You don't need my help. Hello? You can do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it. And I heard the Lord say, you know what you need to spend your time doing, Mike? It's not wanting and not being consumed with your needs and figuring out how you're going to meet them. And that, that goes for your career, your kids, your grandkids, kids, all these things that we're talking about. Let it all go. And the Lord says to me, you know what you need to be doing? I gave you the gift of teaching. Why don't you start using it? Why don't you start spending your time where I put you? And start, start trying to meet all these needs out here. Let some other people go to work. Let some other people work in the church of God, that I, the people that I've called to do those things. You do what I've called you to do. And I got this, I not only got this uh, peace, I not only got uh, this confidence as a result, I got happy. And that's, that's saying a lot. That's, I'm telling you, that's good stuff right there. Right there, that, that you want that. That's a whole lot better than conflict. Depression and the blues. So how, how do you get what I got that day? Well, you have to do it every day. Here's what you have to do. Every day, you wake up in the morning, here's what you got to do. You got to make an adjustment. Okay? The first thing you do with, your Lord, with the Lord is you make the confession to the Lord. Feelings don't have anything to do with it. Emotions don't, don't have anything to do with it. An act of your will. Lord, I don't want anything, and I don't need anything that's outside of your will. If you want me to have something, if you need me to have something, I think you're big enough to give it to me. I think you're capable of giving it to me. So I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to be concerned about that anymore. And if something goes to the left... I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to be faithful to what you gave me to do, see? I'm going to do what you want me to do. And, and it, this is where God wants to get all of us so that our heart is not divided. So that we're not pulled one way towards the world, the stuff we're talking about, and pull the other towards God. The Lord wants to get rid of all that. He wants your heart to be solely devoted to him. It starts, my friends, my brothers and sisters, we're out of time. It starts with a confession. What will happen is you'll go through your day because you don't even realize you're doing a lot of this. You're doing it subconsciously. You'll go through your day and the Lord will pinpoint something that you just did that went awry where you wanted something other than the Lord. You said, I need something. I've got to do something. I've got to step out there independent of God. And the Lord will catch you there. And you can make that adjustment. And then you can get back into the position you were in that morning prayer with the Lord. When you're in agreement with that confession that you made, God will change your life. This is the kind of heart that you really want to have. And you can have it. And that's what the Lord is speaking to these people about in the book of Hebrews. Let's pray. It's just amazing how you can use, Father, a 2,000-year document and rivet our hearts with it, sear them with truth. There's no hiding from you. Help us, Lord. We need revelation. We know faith cometh by hearing, hearing you. Father, help every single one of us today to be committed tomorrow 
to getting with God and making the adjustments that we need to make. Here's the first one. Let us make the right confession. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Let our confession be in agreement with you. The truth, the truth is you're the only one that we need. You're all we need. Let us confess that. And let that confession work its way through our lives throughout the day. And every day that we live for the rest of these days on this earth, help us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.